not when that happens. And I think it's, it's kind of even though the kind of the future is the unknown land in that sense that we don't know where it brings us, I think it's worthwhile to, to, to allow us to think that the future is not as the past. And maybe the past is not so good to return to in any case. So, so uh, I'm quite a kind of optimist from, from that point of view. I think, I mean, let's study change, let's look how it works out and la try to learn along the way, in a way. Mm -hmm. I think that is an important thing that we should do as scientists, but not necessarily play engineers for how to construct uh, a future. Yeah, thank oh, you. Thank you. Very good. Ah, uh, Odina? Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Dieter, for kind of opening up the scene for um, my personal um, point of view or, or vision of um, how this network was able to survive, you know, throughout these years and going to continue to do that. It, it is the type of uh, connections that Emma have pointed out that we were able to um, create with each other um, by sharing our, yeah, the, the spirit of exploration and of course love to this region and, um, and the encouragement that we give to each other but also of course to, the, to our graduate students and well, but mostly of course from the beginning it was important to each other. And then um, my role in this um, community was to uh, put um, on a, this white map of um, Russia, uh, the Arctic uh, territories, is to bring it to everyone's knowledge on what is going on when it comes to the tourist development in the, in the Russian part of the Arctic. And it's an enormous territory that is, um, well, just by looking at the list of the participants of this, um, the 10 anniversaries that we are celebrating, that there is not a single participant from Russia that was able to make to Whitehorse. And um, it sort of both, yeah, it reflects a lot uh, on what is going on when it comes to the geopolitics but, um, and the political situation in the world, of course, but uh, it does not really reflect on what is actually happening in the destinations. And that's coming back to what Dieter has said, is that, yes, these 10 years meant a lot when it comes to the you know, creation of the institutional structures in, in Russia and the governance, governance of, um, of tourism operations in, in Arctic and allowing it, you know, something to happen. But the most important thing, what was going on is actually that, that the tourist entrepreneurs in Russia were making it, making the way through despite those structures. They didn't, they kind of denied their existence and just kind of went with the flow. And that is um, something that has been, we would been able to, to see uh, during these 10 years that more and more people get involved in tourism because they want to share um, the love to the land they have, the, lo the love to the Russian Arctic that they have with the, with the visitors who come there. And um, that is what was you know, kind of driving force that they had. And of course there are impacts and the, yeah, some authorities should really look into them and the volumes are still not, yeah, the, there is no risk of, um, at least with the current president, there is no risk of a overcrowded Russian Arctic. <laughs> you understand why? Because he will remain in the power for yeah, many years to come because he already changed the constitution several times. So, yeah. But um, the the kind of the uh, yeah the the last point that I wanted to make is that I think that also this collaboration between us has allowed um, well me of course to and also I hope what I expect from the from the Russian scholars looking at the, at the tourist development there is this also not being normative but also looking at the, the relationship that the, the tourist entrepreneurs have with the destination and the power of, um, of people liking the land and respecting it. Um, but also I think that I would really want us to, to um, or not us, but the, as researchers of course, to have um, 
to continue with this approach that we have uh, in our network in having a close um, contact and collaboration with the communities that live and despite the rulers are still hanging on to those fantastic places that we have visited throughout these years and really putting attention onto what they want and how they see their future. So asking them rather than coming and telling them, okay, this is how you should do it. But I also realized that they are up to the, you know, the dialogue is very important. And of course, learning from others. So creating and continue being this platform where we can discuss those issues together. That's what going to, I believe that that's what going to continue move us forward. So thank you. Thank you, Alvina. Okay. He actually wants to answer every question. Yeah, no, I'm not going to run through every question. I have no <laughs> remarks prepared, no PowerPoint slides in the two hours that I found out I was going to be on this panel. Um, but I did just want to say a couple quick things. It will be short and sweet again. Um, first of all, I think the, the most impressive piece about the IPTRN is that we've built this sense of community, right? And, Emma showed the community developing and we've become this nice little node of researchers, but I think it's more than that. We've become researchers that care to connect with the community and in relation to what Dieter said, offer our services to that community, right? Whether it's, we don't want to come in and as scholars say, you know, here's how it should be, but how do you want it to be and how can we help in that? So that, to me, really touches to the third point there. And the way that we can help to that, how the IPTRN connects pieces of the puzzle. So in the Antarctic, for years and years, there's been this um, site inventory and looking at site impacts. And I think Margaret will talk to some site impact shore visits related stuff tomorrow. Um, you know, that's been going on in the Antarctic for a long time. And, and now, as researchers bring it to the Arctic, there's this natural connection. And as a community, I think, we're just flourishing because we have this passion for the subject. We have this passion to be very altruistic and offer what scholars can offer to the community. And no one in the community necessarily you know, has that giant academic ego that says, I must be the keynote. Because we've been very conscious of everyone's scholarship is valuable. We want as many graduate students and community members to engage with this conversation. And we've been very intentional about how we've built our conferences around that. So to me, those are just a few minor things to add, and then we can get into the discussion versus hearing from me anymore. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, that's a very good point. Okay, and I, the whole point of the panel then is to actually have people in the audience um, discuss, um, give their thoughts, ask questions, and basically the panelists uh, reply. So. Questions, points, comments, thoughts, stunned silence. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that the fact that the network made it that far is, is uh, I think everybody agrees, is quite an achievement. And um, I'm a bit worried about the word survival that has been used because <laughs> I hope it's not surviving. I thought it was thriving. Uh, what you guys did after the Navic, I mean, uh, I mean, gosh, we have, I think there's a cup there. Yes. Yeah. So we're acting like, I don't know if you call that Danish side products or? Swag. Yeah, <laughs> swag. So, you know, we, we've come a long way. So, so you guys have done, have done a great job actually in, 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 you know, making the, the, the network mature. But you were pointing out the difficulty of uh, attracting people from, from Russia, specifically Russia. Um, Dieter mentioned, with, in reference with Arvid, uh, Vikend, the, the language barrier that at some point, of course it's international, and English is the international language. And if I look at the, 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 the graphic that you made, the different phase of development, so, and not using the word survival, is it possible to think that in the future we could become big enough that we could start having session in other language than English. 
and that could maybe bring some new people in. I, I know on the French speaking side that there's a, a growing number of PhD students and, and who are now established, who have gotten their PhD, uh, focusing exactly on the same topic as they started, the cruise ship tourism, but don't belong to the network because their, their, their skills or their, their level of comfort in, in English is not there. So therefore, they don't come. And even I, when I look at the, the quality of the question, presentation, if I don't want to put myself down, but when I come there and I speak in English, I feel, I feel this limitation. So is it possible to think that in the future, we can start looking at, at having some, some sessions that would be in Russian, that could be in Swedish, that could be in, in, the, in any other language? I know that simultaneous translation is extremely expensive. So, so it's probably not something that can be done in the first uh, in the first trial, but, but to think to open it a bit to, to having session maybe one afternoon after day in other languages. Because the formal presentation in English is almost is always more difficult than the informal talk that we have around the cake. And I think this could be maybe a way to I'm just thinking like this out loud, but this could be a way maybe to to enlarge it to bring New people into the network. Good point. Interesting, uh, interesting point to put forward. We have uh, a perfect opportunity in Argentina. Yeah. Maybe that's something to think about. Or maybe have some panels um, in Spanish uh, to, to begin with, at least, and see how that works. And then I guess what you could do is you don't want to have um, expensive translators, you just have people help out yeah. or you yes. and have the abstracts or something. Yeah, we can try that because we have some colleagues who can just uh, translate a bit informally, not, not with the special equipment or gear or something, but you can translate at least the main points. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see the point and I can sympathize with partic particularly if it comes to kind of inviting new groups. But I think in the long run, actually, I think it's not really working like that. I mean, we're hardly speaking Swedish at the Swedish di uh, university department anyway. We are speaking English. And, uh, and I think that will happen in more and more countries. And uh, I think the thing is maybe, I mean, you know, it kind of by inviting people into a context and realizing that not everybody is speaking English perfectly anyway. And, and, and by, by being kind and, and uh, it, that, that would be my way forward in a way. By, by, because if my experience is often that, I mean, people think that they cannot speak English properly. Uh, but, but in the end, I mean, it's totally functional. And, and, uh, and uh, it's more a question of attitude and how you meet people and how you and embrace what they say or, or not, that, that makes them welcome. And, and maybe the first time they need to speak in Spanish, yes, I agree. But then the second time they dare to speak in English because they see, okay, not everybody's perfect but the other guys either. And, uh, and I think in the long run that for me is kind of, I would guess if I, if I would speak, try to estimate what's going to happen in the future, I think that would be probably the more likely way forward. Although, I mean, I, I acknowledge the idea and, and, and I mean, uh, that Alain uh, proposes. And, and in a way, I mean, it's this kind of idea that uh, everybody should speak more than his native language in English. But even a third language would be, of course, ideal. Because that would enable us to do that. But I think we are far from that and actually moving into the wrong direction, so to speak. I think Edward would want to make a case about presenting in Icelandic. <laughs> yeah, so, so we should all do that. We should all <laughs> Now, you know, on that note, I mean, if you look at that panel, I mean, there are two native English speakers on that panel, right? Just Pat and Emma, and the rest not, right? And that's the general case. Well, I mean, I've been having that case. Well, yeah, but still. That's and I'm a substitute for Harvey, who's not. Who's oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 not? He's only one. Amazing. Now, I mean, it's true. I mean, it is, of course, a, a, a common challenge world over. I mean, uh, English being sort of having been adopted as the lingua franca of academia. I mean, and, and I mean, just, and I think it is correct that we just need to be fully aware of its uh, of its uh, role and uh, to be accommodating to those who are. Uh, at a disadvantage to it. I mean, I think we all appreciate it. 
which, which I feel like we've done as the IPTR yeah, we have to as an open commu a community that that mm -hmm. is small and you know yeah. pretty happy go lucky and <laughs> you know well, I mean, the, 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 the big interest of course is just to learn as well I mean, and, learn, and especially when you engage with communities to actually be able to learn a little bit about the maintenance of the instance, uh, which we, which we none of us well you pretty much speak a little bit uh, yeah. I think uh, not many others but that was not what I was going to talk about. <laughs> I wanted to talk a bit about the uh, uh, um, the conceptual developments, maybe that we need to maybe start working on or start to think about. And a couple of them have been mentioned. And I think the uh, the future of the IPTRM for the next ten years is bright. And I say this for a very solid reason, because tourism is currently emerging to a larger and larger extent in the policy realm of the Arctic and the Antarctic. As, as Emma rightly mentioned, that, and has been pointed out. So I think uh, we have already, we have talked about it before a little bit. We tried to develop a, a white paper for the Arctic Council on tourism issues. We did so, do, it, do it to some extent, uh, so the steering committee at the time, if I remember correctly. Uh, I think we need to maybe start honing in on that a bit more, the uh, sort of uh, uh, tourism relevance and, and how we can 